Is that okay? Can you all see that? Yes. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So look, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and for being here. Um, it, you know, to ask people to come to yet another Zoom meeting is a lot to ask. So I really appreciate that you've turned up. Um, and I, I'm really delighted uh, that uh, that I'm be able to speak in a in a seminar on philosophy of psychiatry. This is not a this is not a, a big a subfield in philosophy, and it's just wonderful to know that there are enough people in the city and maybe elsewhere who are interested in the topic. So uh, I'm going to talk today about delusions. This has been the main area of research that I've been um, focusing on on and off for some years. Uh, I hadn't been working on it for some for some years, but I've come back to it. And uh, I want to tell you about what I've been working on. So this is work in progress. Uh, I should say also, um, uh, do, do feel free if, if there's some clarification, give me a shout. Just show, you know, turn your microphone on and stop me uh, if, if there's something that's unclear. Okay, so there are, as you probably know, people who have some pretty strange beliefs. Um, and some of them are listed here on the screen that Joe Biden is tapping their phone, that the television is sending the messages, that they're the queen of 182 countries or the chief disciple of the Buddha, that their girlfriend is cheating on them with Anthony Fauci or their actions are being controlled by Mark Zuckerberg, that Vladimir Putin is putting thoughts into their head, or that Meryl Streep is madly in love with them. Uh, that their skin is infested with parasites, or that they cause the bushfires in Australia, that they're dead, or that their organs are rotting, uh, or finally that there's a stranger looking at them through their bathroom mirror. So these, of course, are delusions, and they're one of the two or three most characteristic symptoms of schizophrenia, the other primary one, of course, being auditory hallucinations. But they're also... Um, very, very common symptoms in a wide variety of illnesses, uh, maybe most notably in dementia of various kinds, uh, something that uh, doesn't get discussed much in the psychiatric literature for interesting reasons. Uh, I, won't, I won't tell you about those different disorders that's sort of off to one side for today. Uh, the one thing I wanna emphasize just to start off with is a theme I'm gonna come back to. And that, Delusions, for all that they're about a whole, apparently about a whole range of different things, everything from uh, Joe Biden to Mark Zuckerberg to my organs and a stranger in the mirror and so on, in fact, are very, very limited in content. They're, they're, they, they, uh, all delusions, however many a particular patient has, all fall into a very small number of categories. And uh, here are the categories. There's different ways of taxonomizing this, um, but the differences are pretty small. And that, that's true even uh, across different uh, uh, cultural practices in psychiatry. Uh, here's my preferred taxonomy. You can have a look at those, those tags. You'll get a sense of what they mostly mean. Um, uh, but however you taxonomize delusions, it seems to me the most important feature of delusions and a feature that actually uh, doesn't get discussed very much at all, and certainly not nearly enough, is precisely the fact that however wild and various the particular thoughts that a particular patient has, they all fall into one of these dozen or so themes. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this idea later on in the talk. So let me tell you what the talk's about. Most of it is in fact going to be a kind of a critical review of cognitive or cognitive neuropsychiatric models of delusions over the last not quite 50 years. It seems kind of astonishing to think about this because it seemed fairly recent uh, that people had cognitive neuropsychiatrists had been interested in delusions when I started my career uh, working on this. But at any rate, I'm going I'm, uh, I'm to give you a, an overview, a critical overview with a focus in particular on this notion of experience. Uh, experience is universally, strange experiences of a kind I'm gonna describe, uh, are universally a central feature of uh, cognitive models of delusions. Um, and I'm gonna go through the different variants of those models to give you a sense of what their limitations are. And what I'm gonna conclude from the critical discussion is that actually it's probably a mistake to think that experience has the central role in delusions uh, that it does. 
Now, cognitive models of delusions typically are concerned with two fundamental questions. They're usually called the question of formation and the question of retention. Um, the question of formation is, as it says, how does a particular thought content, whether it's that Joe Biden is tapping your phone or that you're dead, how does that thought come to be formed in your mind? What's the mechanism whereby a thought, whether odd or implausible on one end of the spectrum or wildly absurd on the other end, uh, like the, the, the thought that you're dead. So how does this thought actually come into your, come into your mind to begin with? And actually, much of the literature on, on delusions has actually focused on formation as we'll see. But the second question is the question of retention. And that question is in a way tougher. It's the question of why is it that once a thought has actually come into your head, a delusion like thought, why does it stay there? Because after all, most delusions are manifestly at odds with a huge amount of information that you've got access to. Some of the delusions, notably the delusion that you're dead, is, is just about self-contradictory, depending on how you understand that delusion. It's also at odds with what everybody around you is saying. So uh, not surprisingly, someone who develops a delusion gets a lot of pushback from loved ones and all sorts of other people who are shocked by the delusion and immediately try to, try to undermine that delusion. So, uh, both of these questions have been tackled in cognitive models, and we'll see how they emerge in the models uh, that I'm going to discuss in a minute. Now, the, the beginning of the contemporary approach to um, cognitive neuropsychiatry of delusions is actually a very famous paper from 1974 by a psychologist called Brendan Marr. Uh, he was a British-born uh, Harvard psychologist. And in this 1974 paper, Marr makes a proposal that um, was extremely influential. And the proposal has two components, and it, go it goes like this. Uh, Marr supposes, first of all, not just supposes, he thinks he's describing a clinical reality, according to which patients who develop, de the de patients who develop delusions have very vivid unusual, strange, anomalous experiences of some kind. And he, uh, the passage is not in this quote that I've shown, that I'm showing you, but he, he presumes that these things have something to do with, when he says biological, he thinks he, he means something like brain dysfunction, brain damage, and so on. So something pretty dramatically uh, anomalous is happening. That's the first part, a strange experience. And that's where the notion of experience enters into cognitive, the cognitive neuropsychiatry of delusions. But there, there's a second stage then that Marr uh, characterizes as an expl uh, explanation stage. And the explanation stage is just this. When one experiences a very strange, very vivid experience, it cries out for an explanation. Why, why am I having this strange experience? And the patient sets out to explain this anomalous experience with perfectly healthy reasoning capacities, okay? So uh, the person who's having the experience is not disordered in any way other than whatever disorder causes the experience to begin with. So as he says, uh, the patient is using the same cognitive me mechanisms that are found in the normal and scientific theory building capacities. Okay, so we've got a very strange experience. That's anomalous, that's abnormal. Uh, the patient then brings to bear her normal explanatory capacities to try to offer an explanation of why does she's having this strange experience. And the explanation she comes up with is the delusion, okay? So the experience is not the delusion. The delusion is the explanation of the experience. So let's take an example, a very, very well-known example that follows Mars' model. This is um, a very well-known model from 1990 of the Capgrad delusion. Lots of people have heard of that delusion. It's a, characterized usually as the delusion in which a, a person, often a loved one, sometimes a, an object, is experienced or believed to be a duplicate or an imposter. So classically, a man has a stroke, 
uh, or maybe develops uh, Alzheimer's disease. And he looks at his wife and he says, as it were, this person looks just like my wife, but she's not my wife. She's a duplicator, she's an imposter. So this model is due to uh, Hayden Ellis and Andrew Young. Hayden, I couldn't find a picture of Hayden Ellis. He must've been a very modest guy. Uh, no picture on the internet that I could find, but this is a building named after him after he died uh, on the University of Cardiff uh, campus. So he obviously was a, an important and valued colleague. And Andy Young uh, on the right is a psychologist at York in, uh, in England. Now, the model that they developed draws on work that they did on face perception. And I suspect that some of you will, have, will know this model, but I'll run through it for those of you who don't. The, the model begins by looking at an account of prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia is the uh, inability to recognize faces, familiar faces, uh, and it has various causes, but often associated with brain damage. And one of the remarkable findings about some people with prosopagnosia is that when put in front of a familiar face, they'll say, honestly, that they don't recognize the face, but they generate a galvanic skin response in the presence of the familiar face. Their skin conductance changes. And as you know, a galvanic skin response is taken as a measure of all sorts of things. It's a very nonspecific measure. Uh, it can be taken as a, some sort of emotional response, uh, some sort of unconscious response of one sort or another. So how do we explain it in this case? Well, the explanation that Ellison Young offered draws on other work, and it says the following. There are uh, two pathways in the visual system that seem to be responsive to, to visual input and faces in particular. One is uh, identified as the overt pathway. That's the pathway that subserves conscious recognition. And there's a covert pathway, which subserves some sort of unconscious identification or recognition. The hypothesis uh, uh, that this model uh, exemplifies is that prosopagnosia arises when the overt pathway is dysfunctional or damaged. So the person who's suffering from prosopagnosia honestly says, I see the face, I don't know who that is, but they generate a galvanic skin response uh, as a marker, as it were, of some unconscious process that is taken to represent an awareness awareness is in a very general sense of the fact that they're in the presence of a familiar face. So the, the covert system, as it were, functioning normally, continues to contain information about the fact that the face in front of the person is familiar. Okay, so that's the background to the model of Capgra. According to Ellis and Young, Capgra is something like the mirror image, uh, theoretically, of um, prosopagnosia. Instead of it being the case, as in prosopagnosia, that you have damaged the overt pathway with a healthy or normal covert, a visual pathway, you've got the reverse. So what does that mean? It means somebody in the presence of a familiar face will see the face and recognize it as the face of, say, uh, John's wife, John will recognize it as the face of his wife. But because the covert pathway is dysfunctional, is disordered, there's no, as it were, and I'm putting this very metaphorically because it's unclear exactly how we should understand this, there's no kind of visceral recognition that the person in front of John is in fact his wife, okay? So you've got some sort of visual recognition without what we might call familiarity of some uh, as yet sort of undefined sort. Now this, this experience of conscious familiarity without this uh, vi uh, visceral familiarity is a strange experience, right? It's the kind of experience you don't have according to this model, unless there's something uh, wrong with your brain. And just as Mar says, a patient person who has this strange experience feels like the experience calls out for some sort of explanation. And he thinks, well, what could explain why I'm in the presence of somebody who looks like my wife, but doesn't feel like my wife? Well, it must be an imposter. That's what it is to be an imposter or a duplicate or something, right? Somebody who looks like someone, but isn't someone is an imposter. And so the explanation of this experience is the hypothesis that the, the loved one is an imposter.
So uh, it's a very, very beautiful and elegant model. And it's a, it's a perfect example of a Mar style explanation. Now, there's a lot of things to say about this model and it continues to be discussed in literature 40 years later um, because it is probably the best example of a, a model of delusion applied to a particular, particular delusion. Um, one of the things uh, worth noticing though, and this is, I'm not the only person to make this point, is that the explanation uh, that the patient opts for, that the person in front of him is a, is a poster, sounds terribly plausible after you've described the experience. But it's not entirely obvious when you think about it that it is the most plausible hypothesis. Somebody who looks just like your wife but somehow doesn't quite feel right could be explained at least in some other ways, right? This is maybe uh, your wife is secretly very angry at you and she's somehow sending a bad vibe or maybe you've fallen out of love with her or uh, you know uh, maybe your wife has a twin sister that you were never aware of and here she is um, and of course at the back of all of these explanations is something like a default and the default is there's something wrong with me right that's always present and for those of us who are kind of middle-aged and always feeling our aches and pains, right, it's a very common experience suddenly think, what's wrong with me? I'm having a strange experience, something's wrong, right? It's not unusual for us to, uh, to, to think about ourselves as the source of something bizarre rather than the world. So the first question to ask yourself is, you know, is it as obvious that it's sometimes made out? that the imposter explanation really is a natural explanation of the strange experience. But here's the problem. Uh, and this was a problem that was pointed out uh, to Ellison Young fairly soon after their model uh, was, was published. And it's, it's this, um, that we have in effect a strange, exper a strange explanation of a strange experience, if you agree with what I just said, but whether or not the explanation, you take the explanation to be strange or not, the idea that you are living with a, a wife who is an imposter, and this is an ongoing situation, that belief, the belief that's retained in your mental economy over time, surely does seem like a strange belief to have. Um, because even if for a moment you think you're in the presence of an imposter, there's lots and lots and lots of evidence over time that the person you're living with uh, is not an imposter. And indeed, there's lots of people telling you, lots of people you trust, telling you that uh, this is your wife, not an imposter. So the question of why that belief is retained presses on the model, even if you believe the initial explanation of a, uh, the initial generation of the explanation is plausible, the persistence of the explanation seems less and less plausible over time. And the question arises, why is it that the person who has this belief uh, doesn't give it up? Okay. Now, one response to this sort of problem has been a view associated actually with some philosophers that uh, came to be called the endorsement view of, of uh, delusion. And the endorsement view of delusion says, all right, um, it's true that the Capgrad delusion looks like it requires some strange explanation. And it looks like it requires that, you know, there's some other, uh, some, something else that's fishy going on here that prevents the, the, um, the, the patient with delusion from noticing that their belief is, is strange, right? So maybe we just should simplify the account uh, in the following way. When we have perceptual experience, uh, we naturally are disposed to endorse it, right? As a first pass. So, you know, as, as we say, seeing is believing, perceptual experience is typically um, uh, very compelling. And so as a first pass, any perceptual experience you have, all things equal, is going to be endorsed, which to say you're going to believe that the content of the experience is veridical. Okay. Now, of course, there are unusual cases. So here's an incredibly boring, familiar one, the Miller-Lyer illusion. When you first see the Miller-Lyer illusion, 
you're inclined to endorse it, right? You're inclined to say, oh, uh, the, the horizontal line on top looks much shorter than the horizontal line on the bottom. So I believe that the, the line on top is shorter than the line on the bottom. And then uh, somebody shows you that in fact, the lines are equal. And here's the crucial bit, even though you continue to perceive the lines differently, um, you, uh, you can suspend, right? You can suspend your um, impulse to believe that one line is longer than the other and you uh, stop endorsing the experience. Okay, so here's the thought about Capgra then. Somebody, uh, John looks at his wife's face and he sees that uh, this looks just like his wife. It doesn't feel just like his wife. And so he has the same strange experience I talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, and he does what anybody would do, which is say they endorse their experience. He endorses his experience. He's not explaining it. So the question of whether the imposter a story is the, is the best one, is the right one, is the rational one. Maybe we can set that to one side if we make a case that the experience is rich enough, right? That the propositional content of the experience is rich enough that the experience actually sort of presents the wife as an imposter, right? You can tell a bit of a story like that. Uh, and then John having that experience, the rich experience of his wife as imposter presented to him simply endorses it. And unlike the Miller liar illusion, there's no clear perceptual evidence that she isn't uh, an imposter. And so the delusion persists. I think this is a plausible, plausible view. I used, to, I used to believe a version of this some, some time ago, but I don't think it works. Um, so let me now tell you why. Uh, there are lots of strange experiences that we have. Now the Mueller liar experience, uh, you know, um, maybe it's not a good analogy for the, the Capgra experience because it's a visual illusion. It doesn't come about because of any dramatic disorder, dysfunction, brain lesion, and so on of the kind that uh, Marr uh, advocated for. Um, so maybe the story that I told about the Mueller liar illusion um, is, is not so obvious, right? Maybe someone uh, a healthy person doesn't just doesn't just uh, stop the impulse to endorse to endorse their belief, um, and so maybe if somebody has a very strange experience uh, and they they endorse it according to this view, uh, there's simply no way to talk them out of that experience, right? If the experience is really vivid uh, and really compelling, then it won't be like the Mueller liar, where you could sort of trace the length of the lines. And, um, and become convinced that this is just an illusion. Okay, so in other words, the point I'm making is, um, you know, maybe the problem of endorsement is, uh, you know, the, the, the problem of endorsement is, is, is uh, one where, uh, uh, or, or the, sorry, not the problem, but the sort of persuasiveness of the endorsement view uh, has to do with the vividness of the experience that comes about from the kind of biological uh, disorder that Marr envisaged. Well, let me give you uh, a different example that suggests that that's not quite right. Uh, the black and white picture here is just to remind me uh, that the example I want to give you is an example pointed out to me many years ago by a student of mine, uh, Jill Craigie, uh, and it's an example of what's called cerebral achromatopsia. Cerebral achromatopsia is uh, a kind of color blindness that comes about due to cortical damage rather than damage to the eye, um, uh, to an area called V4 that subserves uh, color perception in the cortex. And so someone might have a stroke and come to consciousness from the stroke and experience the world as having been drained of all color. So they see the world as gray. Now this is a disorder, this is a, an anomalous experience due to a brain lesion. It's very compelling, it's pervasive. Uh, and indeed, um, a patient who has this experience might for some time be wondering why it is that the world has suddenly lost all color. Here's the crucial point though. When someone points out to them that the problem is not the world, the problem is them, they immediately accept that, right? They default to that explanation that I pointed to a few minutes ago, according to which 
there's something wrong with them, okay? So even in the case of uh, very um, pervasive, very compelling, strange experiences, uh, patients of all sorts are able to acknowledge that the problem is in them and not in the world. So the question is, uh, why is it that patients with delusions can't do this? The problem can't just be the, the fact that they endorse their experience. We all do that. It can't just be the fact that their experience is strange because other strange experiences like cerebral chromatopsia don't compel the patient to hang on to the belief that something's wrong with the world. So it looks like if all you have to work with is the idea of a strange experience that compels endorsement, uh, we can't explain why it is that the delusion persists. It looks like something else has to be wrong that prevents the patient from saying, oh, guess, right, I guess there's something wrong with me. All right, so in response to that sort of problem, a number of investigators uh, started to think, fair enough, maybe there are two things wrong with people who have delusions. The first thing, of course, is the anomalous experience. That's always there in the models. That's a pervasive feature of, of, of the theories. But just as we, just I said a minute ago that uh, the problem is not just endorsing a strange experience, but hanging on to the strange experience, maybe the thing that um, prevents patients from rejecting the delusional belief uh, um, is underpinned by some other disorder. So let me give you an example of one possibility. Uh, there's a, a, a reasoning bias that's been much discussed in the literature and also the literature in delusion called jumping to conclusions uh, or JTC. And the jumping to conclusions bias uh, is a bias that applies to certain kinds of probabilistic reasoning. And roughly what it says is somebody has a JTC bias if they're inclined to accept a claim about probabilities on the basis of less evidence than one ought to. Now, without going to the details, I'll just report to you that there's been quite a bit of experimental evidence generated that people with delusions do indeed have a jumping to conclusions bias. Uh, and it seems to be characteristic of the delusion and not just say, having schizophrenia, for example. So it looks like there's some evidence that patients with delusion do indeed have this disorder. Now, nobody in the literature that I know of has actually tried to work out what a two-factor model with a jumping to conclusions bias would look like. And I think there's a reason for that. So I won't try to do that myself, but roughly the idea is gonna be this. Uh, the patient has a strange or anomalous experience they endorse that experience or they, uh, maybe they even they explain that experience, but they come up with this bizarre thought. And then instead of doing what a healthy person would do and say, oh, that can't be right. That thought is too strange. That thought is too implausible. That thought is inconsistent with lots of other things that I believe. They somehow accept the thought either because they think the evidence is satisfactory and it's not, or because they don't notice the thought is bizarre or, or something, where the or something has to be filled in with the second disorder, okay, the second factor that explains why the delusion is retained. So very roughly, and this is a bit rough, you can think of the models thus far as saying something like this, these two factor models. Um, a delusion is formed when a, when a very strange experience is encountered that's either somehow endorsed or theorized about, and it generates this delusional idea. And the delusion is retained in the mental economy because there's a second disorder that somehow prevents it from being revised, okay? That's the structure of most models of, uh, of the cognition associated with delusions. Now, the difficulty with two-factor models is that they're domain general, which is to say the second factor is almost always uh, a reasoning disorder of some kind. Now, the problem with appealing to a reasoning disorder like a JTC 
uh, bias is that a reasoning disorder uh, will manifest no matter what a delusional patient is reasoning about. So it's not gonna be rest restricted just to the cases where they're reasoning about their delusional belief. And so a, a two-factor theory, broadly speaking, should make a prediction that patients with delusions have delusional beliefs, but they also have lots of bad beliefs of other kinds. Maybe not delusional beliefs, because they may not have other strange experiences, but they should show lots of defective beliefs that arise from the defect in reasoning that explains why the delusion isn't rejected, okay? But so far as I know, there's no evidence that patients with delusions show these other strange beliefs. Um, patients with delusions, as I say, have strange beliefs that seem utterly restricted to the 12 categories that I described at the beginning of the talk. Okay, so let me try on one more model. This is a model that I think represents the best work in cognitive neuropsychiatry on delusion. It's due to uh, Martin Davies, uh, an Oxford philosopher, Max Coulthart, a neuropsychologist uh, in Australia, and their colleagues. And their second, their two-factor model goes like this. Again, there's a strange experience, that's universal. That experience is endorsed, just as I said uh, experience is when it's vivid and when it's sort of pervasive and compelling. But the second factor that, dis, uh, that delusional patients exhibit, the second disorder, is uh, a failure of, uh, sorry, a, um, an inability to control what they call a prepotent doxastic response to perceptual experience. What that means is that's a long way of saying, um, a long way of saying when we see something like the Mueller liar illusion, we have a disposition to endorse it as veridical. Healthy people will, will withdraw their endorsement from an illusion like Miller Liar when they're given evidence that it's not veridical. Patients with delusions can't control this disposition. They don't have, as it were, something like an impulse control. I mean, it's not an impulse control, but it's as if the perceptual experience is so compelling that they cannot resist it. And so when John sees his wife but doesn't feel she's familiar, he has a strange experience, he endorses it. And when somebody says to him, but look, John, it's very, very implausible that your wife is an imposter. He can't help himself but believe it when he sees his wife. Okay, so that's pretty good, right? That's a pretty good idea because then what you've got is now a second factor that's not domain general. It's only gonna to apply to perception. And if all delusions originate in anomalous perception, then you're more likely to be in the ballpark of having an explanation of why delusional patients have these and only these beliefs that are strange, that are pathological. Nevertheless, it's still too broad, I wanna say. And here's an obvious example of why it's too broad. If you go to a basketball game, and you're sitting in the stadium and you look across the stadium, the people at the far end of the stadium are gonna look small, right? That's a familiar experience. That's, it's just a violation of what's called size constancy. Uh, and little kids who have this experience are surprised by it and think it's real and are puzzled by it. But we quickly learn that that's just the way the visual system works. When people are far away, they look smaller. They're not really smaller. And just like the case of the Mueller liar illusion, we suspend our disposition to say that people have got smaller. But if a delusional patient has a lack of ability to control their disposition to endorse their delusion, then a delusional patient who goes to a basketball game should generate what I call in the language of Seinfeld, a delusion of shrinkage, okay? Uh, they should believe that the people across the stadium really have shrunk because they can't resist the impulse to endorse the veridicality of their belief. But again, so far as I know, nowhere in the literature do we have an account of the delusion of shrinkage or any of the other many, many delusions that one would expect would come about through uh, strange experiences and perception, even strange experiences that are caused by, by brain damage. Okay. Now, that, that problem about the delusion of shrinkage is, is a problem with um, the two-factor theory due to Davies and colleagues. 
But there's a more interesting issue, I think, and that's what I want to sort of come to at the end here. And the issue has to do with how their model is going to apply to other delusions besides uh, the Capgrad illusion. Now, this is not being fair to them, or let me let me be fair to them and say they're only they only present their two-factor model as a model of Capgrad and delusions that are related that they call monothematic, which is to say very narrow delusions. Um, so they're not proposing that their model applies generally across delusions. But of course, uh, lots of people are tempted by a model like this. And uh, any model of delusions is likely to begin with something like a two-factor account. And so I'd like to explore for a bit what a two-factor model is going to look like when it comes to other delusions, particularly the ones that are very common in schizophrenia uh, and other psychiatric illnesses. So let, let's come back to the delusion that Joe Biden is tapping my phone. This is incredibly common sort of delusion. It's a persecutory or paranoid delusion. Uh, it's, it's, it's present everywhere uh, uh, around the world where you see um, uh, delusions, which is to say everywhere. Uh, it's always the most common form of delusion by a long way. So it's very common. Okay, now I don't know of any account where someone offers a two-factor theory of persecutory delusions, but it's quite easy to imagine the kind of strange experience that lies, that might lie or might be thought to lie at the root of a paranoid delusion. We've all had experiences of feeling like people don't like us or people are trying to hurt us or maybe people are excluding us, right? We, we all have versions of that on, on different occasions. So it's quite easy to imagine someone who might have a disorder that makes that feeling very, very strong, very, very compelling, maybe more frightening than it is in ordinary experience or something like that. Okay, so we can imagine an anomalous experience where there's a very powerful feeling of threat or conspiracy or something like that. Okay, now if someone has a pre, uh, can't control their prepotent doxastic impulse to endorse their belief, then they're gonna endorse that strange experience. But what would that endorsement look like? Well, given what I just said, it would have to look like something like this. People are out to get me, okay? That's the classic persecutory delusion. But here's the interesting fact about these delusions. Persecutory delusions are rarely expressed that way. They're almost always expressed in terms of very specific views about the nature of the conspiracy like that Joe Biden is tapping my phone and so on. Delusions are, um, they're dressed up in the specific content drawn from the social life, the personal life of the patient and the culture that the patient lives in. So in China, it's not, you know, Joe Biden who's tapping the phone, it's the communist party or something who's tapping the phone. Now here's the crucial thing. What what I just said shows is that there's almost always going to be a gap between the propositional content presented in the experience, in the putative strange experience of persecution, and the, the content of the delusion itself. There's a conceptual gap associated with the generality of the experience and the specificity of the belief. If uh, you believe that experience is central to delusion and that your delusions are responsive to the experience in the kind of close way that a two-factor theory says it is, then we have no explanation of how it is that the belief that the patient generates is very specific. Notice, by the way, that no patient or almost no patient in the world will ever have anything like a perceptual experience that might be articulated as Joe Biden is tapping my phone. Uh, people don't encounter Joe Biden. They don't see him doing anything that could be interpreted in the delusional way. So the idea that it, what we're doing in delusions is endorsing our experience in the way that the Davies et al. model suggests looks very implausible just because the vast majority of delusions don't count as endorsing experience in any direct way. Uh, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to skip this bit. This is just an elaboration of this idea. And I'll just mention that even in Capgra, which is a very, very narrow delusion, patients do often dress up their delusions in cultural terms. They'll say things like, 
uh, my wife is a robot or my wife is a clone. Okay, so there's there's more going on even in Capra than you might think. So the moral I draw from all of this is is that the problem with uh, contemporary cognitive models of delusion is that delusions uh, are um, representations of very narrow themes. And people have turned to experience, to anomalous experience as a way of trying to match the narrowness, the specificity of the delusional contents, the delusional themes, okay? So experience I think is very attractive to models like this because delusions are very narrow in content. And it looks like experience is the kind of thing which if disordered could generate the appropriately narrow beliefs. The problem is once you turn to the problem of retention, it looks like it's very hard to see how to avoid appealing to something very broad like a reasoning disorder or a problem with the pre-doxastic impulse and so on and so forth. And then what happens is you get a mismatch between the delusions as clinicians understand them and the kind of behavior that one would expect to see from delusional patients. Okay, so what's my, what's my advice? Uh, I'm inclined to say that after thinking about this for a long time, uh, the best thing to do would be to abandon experience as a central uh, component of cognitive theories of delusion. I know this is sort of it's a bit of a radical claim because this is a central feature of all these all these models. But I can't see any other way out of the kinds of problems that I've pointed to, which sort of bounce around from model to model. Now, I just want to say one thing in closing. I don't want to I don't want to mislead you. I don't want to want you to think that what I'm saying is that patients with delusions don't have strange experiences. I think they do. Some of those experiences I suspect are perfectly normal given the beliefs they have. So if someone believes that um, Joe Biden is tapping his phone, it would be perfectly natural for them to be extremely frightened. That doesn't mean that the fear causes the delusion, right? That's a case where the delusion causes the fear. And I suspect that in lots of, uh, in lots of powerful experiences in delusion, it's the delusion that comes first and the experience that comes later. But there may also be lots of strange experiences that are causal in delusion. I just don't think that those strange experiences can do the job that the models uh, want them to do. I'll say finally, just a few days ago, a colleague of mine sent me a preprint of a paper um, on exactly this topic on experience in delusion. And one of the authors is Lewis Sass, a um, very famous psychologist you may know, who's very philosophically sophisticated. And what they do in the study uh, is uh, they, they ask patients about their experiences and they come to lots of interesting conclusions. They, they do identify all sorts of strange experiences in schizophrenia, though not particularly associated with delusions. But at the end of the paper, they have a note and here's what the note reads, okay? That when they began to do their experiment, they did a kind of a fairly systematic review of the literature and they found no studies directly investigating the nature of delusional reality in individuals with experience. Now, this is a paper that was written more or less 20 minutes ago. And what it says is that although experience has been the centerpiece of cognitive models of delusions for the last 50 years, no one until these folks uh, has ever bothered to find out whether delusional patients actually have strange experiences. And I think what that shows is that it's been a kind of a dogma of cognitive neuropsychiatry that disordered experience is central to delusions. And my view is that it's, uh, uh, it's uh, high time to give up that dogma now. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jan Gold, for this presentation. Thank you. We're now gonna have a time for, for questions. So um, ideally, if you have a question, can you write it in the chat? And we're gonna take the questions um, in the order they appear in the chat. Sarah, do you want me to read them or are you gonna read them? 
Uh, no, people can just write their names um, oh, I see. or okay. something and then ask their question. But Got if it. they want to write the question, we can, I can read them um, if, if, um, if they want to ask them in, in writing. All right, so uh, the first question will be uh, Natalia Washington. Hi, Ian. Thanks very much for your talk. Thank you. Um, so my question concerns um, like the simplicity of models like this, um, because I, I love teaching about the, the you know, pairing the prosopagnosia and capgras dilution distinction, because especially for like undergraduate students in cognitive science, it's a really easy way to demonstrate how, you know, um, evidence from psychopathology can affect, you know, broader mo models that we have in the brain, but it's, it's super simplistic and that's why it's useful in that way. Um, and I'm wondering, um, with respect to delusion in particular, um, why not think that what's going on with the shortcomings of some of the models that you talked about isn't that they, um, uh, center the perceptual experience, but that they just haven't taken into account um, enough uh, sort of pieces of the puzzle on how those pieces can affect each other. So the example would be like um, with the Mueller-Lyer illusion, that's not a very like emotionally salient illusion. I'm not like deeply existentially troubled if I continue to see the lines as unequal length, right? But I would be deeply troubled if it's, it continued to appear to me that my spouse was not my spouse or something like that. And so, you know, the, the emotional salience and, and stress that that causes might be a factor or delusions that involve other people who are in on the, the group. So, um, you know, when you start to get to a sort of cultish belief, so are there other people who are supporting this? Does it break my social network to have this false belief? Does it um, mean that I have to alter other strong beliefs that I have. So like if you had a model that took uh, into account several different, of the, uh, different factors like this and weighed them against each other, would that be something that was more um, in line with your view of how this works? Uh, oh, thank you, it's a, a terrific question. And I, I think the answer surely must be yes. Um, I don't know uh, of any kind of systematic work looking at those looking at those different factors. I, I'm per particularly attracted to this idea of emotional importance, emotional salience. You could easily imagine, I mean, in, in our ordinary experience, when we're very frightened or, uh, you know, very anxious or even very happy, our attention is focused on the relevant thing. We tend to block other things out. So there are all sorts of things that could be going wrong. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll fess up that in my thinking about delusion, I'm operating on a methodological assumption, which could easily be wrong, which is that all delusions should have the same sort of cognitive backbone. In other words, that any model I come up with should be able to be applied, at least, you know, broadly speaking, to all delusions. And the problem is that the kind of factors you're pointing to, though I suspect that they are present in some cases, are not present in all or in even sometimes in many. So let's take the cat breath. Um, you would indeed think that somebody who uh, has a stroke and wakes up and sees his wife and thinks she's been duplicated and she's an imposter would be distressed. And pa some patients are distressed, um, but just as often they, they're not distressed. Um, in fact, there are patients who continue to live with the imposter. Uh, they don't like it <laughs> always, but they, they do continue to live with the imposter. Moreover, uh, to the extent that they are distressed, they don't seem to be motivated by their distress. So you don't hear of patients who say, listen, I've got to call the police right now and find out where my wife is, right? Uh, the, the, the presence of the imposter is taken as a given and the wife seems to sort of vanish from the equation. There, there's another thing that I'll mention here, um, which is that, uh, there are other disorders where delusions are present um, and uh, where the kind of distress you're describing, again, is not very common or where strong feeling is not very common or uh, powerful motivation. So in dementia, right, uh, delusions are very common. It looks like there may even be uh, what's called a psychotic phenotype of dementia. 
So a, a different version of Alzheimer's disease or prefrontal dementia. And those patients, now there's other things wrong with them, um, uh, but those patients, again, don't seem to be terribly motivated by their delusions. I'll mention one other disorder, delusional disorder is a DSM disorder. It's characterized exclusively by very, very narrow or small island of delusions in an otherwise perfectly normal mental economy. And these are people, and they're very, very stable delusions. And these are people who are doctors and lawyers and have families and they have perfectly normal lives. Uh, and you would never know there's anything wrong with them until you ask them about their delusion and then they, they get quite exercised. So somehow delusions seem to be able to be contained in a way that seems a bit inconsistent with some of the other factors that you're mentioning, though I totally agree with you that those factors surely seem to be relevant in the phenomenology. So I think, I think the short answer to your question is yes, people ought to be looking at these things, but I also have some doubts that they're gonna solve the problem in a more general way. Hmm. Yeah, thanks. I guess I, I thought that adding more fa factors would make a model more flexible in that it can cover some of these strange situations. Like if it's not emotionally salient and if it's not interrupting your social life, it could be stickier or something like that. But I take your point, thank you. All right, uh, next question would be uh, Kathleen Levenstein. Hey, my question is building a little bit on the question that Natalia just asked regarding like the role of mo emotion and delusions. And it's a little bit specific to schizophrenia spectrum disorders because I, I see your point you're making about how often in dementia one can have a delusion that's very separate from distress regarding the delusion. But I was wondering if you could talk a bit more on how you understand the role of demotion, emotion and delusion because my understanding is that when you look at delusions from the perspective of critical mental health and phenomenological accounts by individuals who have lived experience of delusion, they often talked about experiencing very strong emotion and there being this explicit focus on the link between the delusion and the emotion. And particularly when we look at perspectives by therapists who do more critical work in therapy regarding delusion, there's often the sense that if you can trace this thread and uncover the meaning behind the delusion, you can then work with it psychotherapeutically. And I was wondering if you could speak more to that and how that fits in your framework. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And it comes to the point I made toward the end of the talk um, uh, about the, the, the idea that um, I certainly don't want to deny that, that patients have strong, uh, strong emotions uh, and, and, and uh, painful emotions and distress of all kinds, that, that's just manifestly true. Um, the reason I, uh, and, and so I should say, right, I, I'm, I'm open to be convinced that, that emotion should retain a place in the formation retention of delusion story. The, the, the thing about the case you mentioned though, is, is this, I don't know of any evidence that's looked uh, in any kind of systematic way at the question I raised a few minutes ago about what, wh which direction the causal error is going in, right? So, the, the standard cognitive stories say you have some experience and it could be an emotional experience and that experience leads you to, or either somehow automatically generates a delusion or leads you to consider the possibility that becomes a delusional idea. That scenario, which is what these models advocate and a scenario that says patients have delusions and delusions are almost always distressing uh, and patients who have distressing beliefs are going to have concomitant distressing emotions. But so in other words, I'm offering something like a version of Mars story, right? You have the, the pathology is in the belief and then you, you may for all we know, have a perfectly normal emotional life that is generating the normal responses to the strange beliefs. Um, and, and you do see this a little bit, right? Um, in patients I know of who, um, these are not my patients, I'm not a clinician, but patients I've talked to, they're psychiatrists about who have grandiose delusions have are, are often very happy they're very excited they feel terribly important and so on so um it just seems to be ambiguous at that stage what 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 comes first and uh so now so that's that's the first part now the question about treatment i have um i, I don't have much to say about it um i know as you say that uh therapists can work with emotions in, in patients with schizophrenia the way they would with other patients. I don't know what to make of the, um, the interpretive component uh, in treating the disorder. So I take it what you're thinking is, look, 
if understanding an emotion leads to the resolution of symptoms, isn't that evidence that the emotion somehow plays a causal role in the symptoms? Or, you know, that would be, a, maybe you're not saying that, but that would be an objection to my view. Um, and, and that may be, and that would be a nice study to, to, to try to do. I'm inclined to say the evidence that we've got suggests that, not surprisingly, what does the therapeutic work is the therapeutic alliance, the trust, the kind of things that do the work in any clinical encounter. Um, and so you get the same benefit, say, from CBT as you might from dynamic therapy. In fact, as far as I know, CBT only is the only therapy for which there's lots of evidence, but I'm open to the idea that dynamic therapy is effective. So again, I think the default view wouldn't support the, the anomalous experience story, but, but I'm open to, to being convinced. Okay, uh, next question will be uh, you, Yinan. Hi, uh, thank Hi. you. Hi. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really interesting. I have so many questions. I feel like I could talk for, for hours if I throw all of them at you. Uh, so just to follow up on that, you mentioned that there are very narrow delusions that a lot of uh, doctors, lawyers that uh, uh, hold. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about the, what the specific delusion is? I've never heard of that. Yeah, so so delusions are um, are symptoms, right? They're always symptoms of an illness. But this one uh, or disorder in psychiatry, there is a disorder called delusional disorder. It's in the DSM, uh, and it's characterized exclusively by the presence of delusions. And uh, there are five subtypes: uh, paranoid. Uh, grandiose, somatic, erotomanic, and one other, I can't remember. Um, so, which is to say, the, the particular beliefs that these patients have are always about those themes. Um, it, it's a very rare disorder, or quite rare, a nihilistic, somebody says, Mona, thank you, nihilistic. Um, uh, it's a rare disorder, so I'm told that uh, you know, a psychiatrist who works in a big general clinic might see three or four such patients a year. Uh, and so it's difficult to study these patients just because it's hard to get them. Um, they also tend to be even more than patients with schizophrenia, very resistant to being, they tend to be very suspicious just as a personality feature. So they're reluctant to participate in, in experiments and so on. Um, so, but, but what's interesting about these patients is that unlike patients with schizophrenia, uh, who have lots of things wrong with them, uh, delusion seems to be the only, the only issue. There's, unlike chronic patients with schizophrenia, there's no change in IQ. There seems to be no change in, in cognition generally. Uh, there's no, um, uh, there's no uh, you know, dysfunction in, you know, in everyday life. There's no negative, uh, negative features and so on. And so in a certain way, studying delusional disorder patients is a bit of the holy grail for understanding delusions because in all other patients, the cognition and the biological mechanisms are confounded by what else is wrong with these folks. Um, but yeah, they're not very well studied. So, but, but as I say, they, uh, I've only ever met one such person, not in the course of my research. I happened to go to school with somebody uh, when I was in grad school many, many years ago. Uh, and she was somebody who I thought was a perfectly normal, healthy person. And uh, then I encountered, I encountered an experience with her where she manifested delusion and it's like she became a different person. So, yeah. Um, can I ask another question? Yeah, maybe another one. Yeah, 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 yes. sure. Uh, yes, so uh, I don't want to misunderstand your, uh, your view, but at the end you mentioned that uh, uh, it's, uh, we should take the focus out from experience, from experience, uh, are you are you talking about research or just the theoretical model, or talking about practice? And like, if we're talking about therapy, if we're not focusing on the experience, like, what do you think we should focus on? Right, right. No, no, not therapy. I have. I'm not a clinician, so I, I really have nothing, nothing I can say about it. Um, no, what I mean, yeah. Sorry, I put that in a slightly metaphorical way. What I mean is that. I would encourage people working in the area to start to develop models of delusion that don't begin in the way that all the models have since Mar with an anomalous experience. If you want to have anomalous experiences in there, 
I would suggest that you build them in as consequences. Uh, I mean, just as an experiment, right? I, you know, I don't know. So, I mean, I have, you know, things I think, but uh, I'd be quite happy to see people doing all sorts of things, including things I don't believe in, because I think uh, we're just stuck to a certain extent in this idea that experience uh, is obviously central. And I was so shocked when I came across the fairs paper um, to see something that I'd suspected, but, you know, didn't know that no one's ever asked the question, what, you know, so for example, I mean, I have a, I have a student and I, she's about to start her master's degree uh, with a colleague of mine at the uh, early psychosis clinic at the Douglas. And what I wanted her to do for her master's thesis was exactly this study. I wanted her to, to work with first episode psychosis patients who are just beginning to develop delusions, right? People in the prodromal phase and ask them what they were experiencing and try to tease out whether the strange experiences that you might predict are at the root of delusions come first and then the delusions or whether the delusions start to appear and then the experience happens. I mean, it's not easy to, to tell, maybe there, there are methodological issues here, but I would, I would just love someone to go and do that. Ask, ask early, ask young patients what they're experiencing. And then we can at least have some sense of whether there's a reason to think experiences are central as so many people have suggested. Thank you so much. Um, okay, in the chat, we have uh, Miriam Solomon saying, uh, do capgrass patients have a galvanic skin response to the people they think are imposters? This would be easy to test. So I don't know if you would like to comment on that. Sure. So um, I see that Luke has already uh, answered the question. I don't actually, I'm just looking at the abstract he put up. So let me answer from, from um, let me give you the standard answer. So there is, I only know of a couple of, one or two studies, fairly early studies, much before the one that Luke put up, um, uh, of Capgrap patients uh, and galvanic skin response. And the, uh, the experiment I'm thinking of did indeed show that patients with Capgra don't, sorry, the patients with Capgra, right, don't generate a galvanic skin response. Now, the experiment I'm thinking of, though, didn't do quite the experiment they should have. I guess it was too, that's right, 1997, Ellison Young. Uh, it was too difficult to do. What they did, as I remember, it's well since I read this paper, is show patients pictures of famous people. So not people who were loved ones, close ones, actual familiar others. So there's a slightly different sense of recognition um, in that paper. Uh, I, I, as I say, I, I don't, I can't remember off the top of my head whether I, uh, I don't think I know the paper Luke's mentioning, so maybe he can say something about that. Thank you. I wonder if you would, um, if I could ask you a second question and ask you what you think is uh, the reason for the um, relatively few themes that delusions have. Right, so uh, yes, I do have a story about that. Um, in a way that's been the this, this central thing I've been working on uh, for some time. I won't put up the slide because um, it'll just take too long. But if you look down the list of 12 themes, the first thing you notice is that they're almost all, I say all, but, but anyway, superficially almost all about the social world. Now, again, I'm not the first person to say this. I can think of at least one other. Um, they're almost all about the social world, about me in relation to other people. That's the first thing. Now, that may be a coincidence, but it strikes me as a good methodological principle that something uh, as surprising as that should be assumed not to be a coincidence until it's proven to be a coincidence. So that people are trying to harm me, that I'm very powerful, often understood as having higher status than other people, right? That um, my wife is cheating on me, jealousy, that some very important person is in love with me, that people aren't who they say they are, and, and so on and so forth. So um, that's the first thing to say. Second thing to say is if you look at uh, if you start to try to break down the, the 12 categories into subcategories, you can account for about two thirds or three quarters of them by noticing that 
Uh, a bunch of them have to do with other people threatening me socially, and a bunch of them have to do with me being powerful enough to resist that social threat. And so what I, what I believe is that delusions are indeed all the manifestation of a single cognitive system, probably a very old evolutionary system that evolved to detect social threats and that evolved therefore to enable human beings to live in large social groups without being taken advantage of too badly. Uh, where threat here doesn't mean um, physical threat, it means threats like um, free, free loading, you know, free riding, uh, you know, so, social things, having, having your stuff, having your stuff taken, being uh, exploited in effect. So I've got, I've got I, I wrote a, a book with my brother who's a psychiatrist some years ago where we developed this idea. Um, but that's one very central reason why I think a theory of delusion ought to start off by at least trying to be a kind of single thing that explains all the delusions that we see in different disorders. Again, in the chat, we have a, a comment. So uh, it's interesting that conspiracy theories are usually about the society rather than the person. Would you like to comment on that? Yes. Uh, sorry, which one? Um, just. It's the last one. Oh, the last one. Interesting. Conspiracy theories are usually about the society rather than the person. Yes, exactly. So um, I guess the way I, when I'm, if I, if I were to put things carefully, uh, I would say the following thing. I think that delusions, as I said a minute ago, are fundamentally the, the distorted output of a system which, when it's working properly, is helping you avoid nasty people, people who are likely to take advantage of you. Okay, that, that's the bottom line. Uh, so delusions, on my view, fulfill something like the same role that some evolutionary psychologists have thought gossip fulfills, right? Why do we like gossip, according to one you know, very popular view that Robin Dunbar developed. We like gossip because uh, it tells us nasty things about people. And it's good to know nasty things about people in case you ever encounter them. I don't know if I believe that, but roughly speaking, the, I say the, the beliefs that are uh, generated by a healthy functioning system have that as a, as a purpose. Now, um, that's why most beliefs are outward focused. They're about other people. I think there are some beliefs that are about me because of course, in order to understand the status of other people, I have to understand how they're related to me. So it doesn't matter to me if somebody is dangerous, but uh, they're not dangerous to me, okay? Um, so what I think is going on in delusions at the mechanistic level is that the brain actually builds up a kind of a social map with me at the center uh, and with all the other people who seem to be relevant to me uh, in various relations to me. Uh, and I think that what that system does is it tries to keep track of those people and it tries to keep track of their intentions. So you may know that in, uh, there's some evidence that in schizophrenia, there's a disorder of theory of mind, right? The ability to think about the thoughts of other people. I suspect that's right. I suspect that in order to keep, keep dangers at bay, we have to start to wonder what somebody is thinking. Anyhow, I mean, this is off the topic, but um, yeah. So I, I think it's not at all surprising that paranoid delusions, but indeed other delusions too, are about other people, the people around me. Incidentally, I'll say one other thing. What are the grandiose type delusions? That's the other category. Those are the delusions that represent that part of the capacity that's there not to detect threats, but to respond to threats, right? So what does an animal do when it's threatened physically in, in, in the environment, right? It blows itself up, right? Zebras gather together to look like a big animal. For example, what do human beings do? We don't we don't blow ourselves up physically. We blow ourselves up socially. We say, "I'm the queen of 182 uh, cities. I am, you know, I am Donald Trump." I mean, we we tell each other our CVs all the time. We say, "I am terribly powerful," and therefore, if you are uh, uh, intending to threaten me, you better think twice. Uh, and so, there are a number of delusions that have, I think, that content of trying to communicate. Uh, power to somebody who's potentially a threat. Okay, another uh, comment in the chat uh, from Patrick Daly. Uh, our beliefs that same as judgments 
on your account? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I don't have a sort of well worked out view. I guess it depends, of course, on what you take belief and judgment to be. There is, uh, as you know, in the literature, there are views about delusions that that try to explain delusions by by suggesting they're not full blooded beliefs. So they are uh, they have propositional content, but with slightly different character uh, or that the ad, the attitude we take to the content is slightly different. So um, the idea that delusions are actually uh, wishes um, or imagination, uh, but they're expressed as belief is a view that's out there. Um, again, I. I've tried as a methodological principle to assume what seems to be the case, which is that people who have delusions genuinely believe them as full-blooded beliefs. Now, one thing a philosopher might say is, look, you know, what do we learn in epistemology 101? Delu uh, all beliefs have to have two essential features. Their beliefs are part of a web and beliefs are motivating together with desires, right? Delusions are not part of a web, they're dissociated from the web of belief, and they're often not motivating. So by definition, they can't be beliefs. So that's, that's, that's an acceptable view, I think. Um, the view that I take is, uh, let's assume they are beliefs and that the reason they have those bizarre characteristics is because they're pathological. The goal is to try to understand why they're pathological. I think that second thing that I'm advocating is tougher to do. And so I think it's it's better to try to to try to to try to do that, but you, you may very well be right that something um, thinner, a thinner notion, um, might be uh, might be the best way to go ultimately. So, if I could ask a follow up, the, um, the so, and I'm coming at it more from an epistemological um, framework that that might um, be a basis for empirical studies and, and the presuppositions that go into the way you set up an empirical study. Um, but anyway, um, what I think uh, Kathleen earlier asked about meaning, and I, I think she used that term. I don't recall that you really incorporated that term in the way you presented the topic, but uh, how would you relate meaning to, to judgment or belief? as opposed to experience and how, how are those all related? Ah, good, yeah. So that's a great question and that's a hard question. I don't really have a good answer. To the extent that delusions have meaning, I think they, have, uh, they don't have uh, personal meaning. So they don't have meaning in the, in, the, in the clinical sense that a particular patient's articulation of their belief, fantasy or whatever would be interpretable um, uh, in, in the traditional way. I think the meanings have to do with the cognitive functions I alluded to a little while ago. So when someone has a persecutory delusion, the meaning of that delusion is something to do with uh, a fear of social threat. Now, having said that though, it is perfectly clear that patients do elaborate their delusions in ways that are specific to them. And I think a case can be made that when a particular patient has a delusion, although the delusion, the content of the delusion is fundamentally driven by the function of the, of the, of the uh, cognitive capacity that's generating it, it is true that patients will sometimes add on uh, sort of particular embroidery that does seem to have particular meaning in their life. So I'm thinking in particular of a patient, the patient who said she was the queen of 182 countries was a patient of my brother's um, who, who um, was, he said, the most grandiose patient he'd ever encountered in his clinical practice. And he did try to interpret her experiences for her. And, and I could go through some of her particular delusions that, that did resonate with her experience in her marriage, that resonated with some of her experience in her early life and so on. So I, it's not at all to say, none of what I said here should be taken to suggest that a clinician working with the particular ideas has nothing to work with, okay? Um, I think any, I mean, patients with psychosis are first and foremost human beings who have all sorts of experience and th those experiences do manifest. But I, I do think, as I say, the primary content of these delusions has more to do with the disordered cognitive apparatus than with individual experience. Thank you. 
Great. Uh, again, a question coming from the chat, so from uh, Jean-Pierre Rousseau. Uh, in Finland, with open dialogue, they have very good results at treating early stage psychosis with some kind of therapy. What is your opinion about it? Yeah, I, I mean, again, I'm not being a clinician or a researcher who works on clinical practice. I, 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 don't, have, um, I don't have much to say about it, but I'm absolutely persuaded uh, that psychotherapy is absolutely essential in the treatment of, of uh, psychosis. As you know, there's lots and lots of evidence that cognitive behavioral therapy is very effective at treating delusions. Um, and in Britain, uh, though not, I don't think in Canada yet, uh, CBT is taken to be a uh, gold standard treatment with antipsychotic medication of psychotic patients. So I think there's a recognition in some parts of the psychiatric world that therapy is absolutely efficacious. And as I say, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very open to the idea that um, because patients are first and foremost human beings, that whatever they say, even when they're talking about the, their delusions, some aspect of their own experience in humanity is going to is going to come through. So I'm absolutely I'm absolutely open to this. I actually encountered a psychiatrist in Israel a few years ago who was interested in going back to some early. He's actually an American originally, and interested in some sort of um, early experiments where patients with schizophrenia were not treated at all, but lived together communally and provided social support and so on. And he was convinced that this, you know, that that the evidence of its the effectiveness had kind of been suppressed in favor of, uh, you know, of, of the essential nature of drug treatment and so on. I think uh, we know so little about what's going on that um, everything ought to be tried. I'm certainly convinced that psychotherapy is is central to psychosis. Incidentally, I'll say one other thing about this. Um, just for those of you who are psychiatrists, one of the things my my so my my brother. Uh, worked in an inpatient unit in New York for many, many years, running a clinic for people with psychosis. That was his bread and butter. And he once made a point to me years and years ago that I, I found very sort of touching and, and very revealing. Um, he said to me, you know, uh, uh, no matter how depressed a patient is, for example, if they're so depressed that they have to be brought in by a relative and they can hardly speak and they can hardly move, the first thing a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist wants to know is what's going on in your life? You know, are you married? Have you just had a breakup? Do you have children? Are you working and so on, uh, right? Even when you believe that the thing in front of you as a psychiatrist is a manifestation of a biological disorder, the first thing you ask is about the, the person. He says, and what he said to me though, is the first thing you ask about somebody who's got a, uh, has a psychotic break is what drug should I try? And I think that's a terrible gap in, I mean, it's understandable right? Because the experience of patients with psychosis is so alien, even for psychiatrists. But I think the point he was making was, you know, psychotic patients are human beings too. And the only way to understand a human being is by asking them about them and their experience. And that's perfectly consistent with the belief that their delusions and hallucinations are biological disorders. Um, what does one have to do with the other, right? <laughs> Uh, next question from the chat again, uh, from uh, Yu Yinan. So if I understand correctly, you would like to see models of delusions that do not always start with strange experiences. What would be possible causes? Uh, will there always be a starting point? And uh, a lot of people believe in triggers that led to delusions. What do you think, um, Dr. Gold? Right, so uh, th that's, the, that's the big question. Uh, I mean, the kind of model I'm attracted to now um, but although I'm still, you know, trying to work out the very first details, so I hardly have, it's hardly, I mean, calling it a model is, is glorifying it in a big way. But I'm inclined to start to wonder about delusions as products of a belief formation mechanism. So rather than say, oh, we have some experience or some, there's some mental state that isn't a delusion, that's abnormal, and that starts off some process that ends in a delusion, what I want to say is that the delusion is the product. The delusion is uh, the output of a system whose purpose it is to generate beliefs or belief-like states. Now, right, okay, so that's gonna, that's gonna avoid the problems of experience. No doubt there are gonna be about 5,000 other problems, not least the problem of retention, right? So let's, so you might say, well, how does that help you, Ian, right? You generate a strange belief. You still have a strange belief in your head, 
the problem of retention is as big a problem for you as it is for other people. So there are lots of questions here. Um, but I think the virtue of understanding uh, delusions as primary disorders, primary products of a disordered system, is that you don't have to appeal to a whole, either to a normal reasoning process that gets you to a strange outcome or to a strange reasoning process that doesn't manifest anywhere in your uh, mental economy. And about triggers, yeah, triggers, um, I, I agree with you, triggers are important though, I'm inclined to think of triggers as the kinds of stressors that move a whole system in the direction of dysfunction rather than a particular trigger for a particular delusion. Um, I have no evidence for this. It's just, again, an assumption. Um, but uh, I don't know of very good evidence to suggest that uh, the kinds of delusions that somebody develops in a first episode, for example, has a relation in content to a particular kind of stress or their experience right now. Okay, so you know you're you're uh, an undergraduate male, say the sort of standard age when men start to develop psychotic experiences. There's lots of stress there, right? You know, you're out on your own for the first time. You're trying to pass your courses. You're worrying about your life. Um, but I don't know of any evidence that the particular worries that they have lead to the particular kinds of the delusions they do. This is something that could be explored experimentally. I just don't know of anyone who's done it. Right. Um, okay, I think we have another question in the chat again. Um, okay, so this is a, a long one, but I'm going to read it. So, um, as you described in the beginning, for example, when a patient, a patient has a posopagnosia of fa famous people, the patient should first recognize that person as famous for uh, ignoring the visual input in the first place. Uh, it is specifically peculiar because in ordinary visual agnosia, like uh, the inability to see loved ones, as the patient has various uh, personal ideas and perceptive inputs of the loved one, uh, the loved one's selectivity will be apparent. However, uh, that is not the case for the prosopagnosia of famous people. Um, every patient should have more or less the same understanding of who is famous and who is not to ignore um, the visual input. Um, how a concept uh, that's subjective uh, can be shared among the patients uh, that much accurately. Right. Um, so I'm not sure I completely understood the question, but let me say a couple of things and you can tell me whether I'm on the right track. So prosopagnosia, uh, the, the neurological disorder, is a disorder uh, of recognition of familiar faces. Okay. So some of prosopagnosia simply you know, we'll see a face, meet someone, and then on meeting them again, doesn't recognize them as having been encountered before. Uh, so it's, it's a general, it, it's a disorder across the board, um, and it can be really debilitating. Uh, in the case of CAPGRA, the issue is a bit more complicated because the question has to do with pairing of uh, recognition of a face that's familiar with this galvanic skin response. Um, and the point I was making about famous faces is that while it's true that you would expect a person with Capgras to recognize a famous face, but not generate a galvanic skin response, um, that experiment is kind of assuming that what matters in Capgras is familiarity. And I think that another interpretation of Capgras is that it's only a specific, quite narrow class of people and things that count as, or that tend to be subject to the imposter belief. It's not any person. Um, and so something more than familiarity might be necessary. So if you want to test that idea, what you should do is do an experiment where you show a patient, not just people they know, but people they know and are close to them in certain ways to be explored. That, that was that idea. I don't know if that's, that's answering your question. Uh, are there any other questions? We might have time for one more. All right, so uh, 
Well, uh, I'm going to thank our uh, speaker for today, Yen Gal. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful talk. Very interesting. Uh, thanks also to all of you for being here today, uh, asking great questions. That was a very nice discussion. Uh, and uh, if you like the event, I will uh, encourage you to register for the next event. Uh, and um, I'm going to uh, invite you to, to the next one. In two weeks, we have um, Amandine Catala from uh, University of Quebec at Montreal, who's going to talk about autism and epistemic injustice. Uh, so do not forget to register uh, on the website. Thank you all very much. The questions were wonderful. I really appreciate them. And thanks again for the invitation. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye. Um, excuse me, and I do have a question. I heard about this uh, presentation from someone else. I don't know which website or which event you're talking about. Can you? All right. Yeah. So I put the link in the in the chat. So it's um, uh, if you go to philosophyofpsychiatry.com, all the events are in the uh, are on the main page, and you can register to uh, to to every event. Got it. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a good day. Thanks for being here. Thank you.